David Sheen is an investigative journalist who has written a number of pieces on the Kahanist movement, including on the murder of Alex Audi. So let me let me step back. So who is, for those who don't know, who was Mayur Kahani? And what what did he want? What was his ideology? By Mayor Kahana was an American-born Jewish rabbi who immigrated to Israel, became a lawmaker, a member of Israel's Knesset. And there's so much to unpack, but uh, in, in the, the shortest version of it was that uh, his ideology and what set him apart uh, from other secular Zionists and from religious Zionists in Israel, um, what set him apart, he was even, you know, so far past the farthest right parties in Israel. He wasn't just that he, like the most extreme settlers, wanted to, you know, be vigilantes, you know, and encroach upon Palestinian land, you know, be the, the, the vanguard of the, you know, Zionist colonist movement. But in addition to this, they didn't just, like the, settler, the regular settlers, believe that, oh, we have no choice but to be violent with these Palestinians, with these non-Jews in our midst. Because what to do, you know, it, this, this has been, you know, forced upon us by the situation. So unfortunately, we have no choice but to, you know, take a heavy hand with them. No, the Kahanists distinguished themselves from the rest of the far-right settlement movement by by saying, no, 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 it's actually a mitzvah, it's actually a good deed, it's actually a, a blessing, it's actually a sacrament to kill Palestinians, to kill Arabs, to kill non-Jews that get in their way. So but they actually celebrated it and they turned it into the greatest mitzvah. That, that kind of, I would say, theologically is what set them apart. And then, of course, they put that into practice. And over the last you know, 50 plus years, they've committed 60 plus racist murders. And that's officially, uh, I have, you know, I, I, I'm, I can't get too much into some of the stories that I'm working on, but there's, you know, credible evidence that they actually murdered more than twice that number. In any case, 60 plus documented racist murders, mostly Palestinians, mostly in Palestine over the last uh, half century. So we're talking about certainly a fringe movement, uh, the furthest right fringes of Israeli politics, but, uh, one that it, in many ways has been the vanguard, been the most, uh, you know, has, has pulled the Israeli government inexorably further and further to the right, where now, you know, we have them actually back in the Knesset with the help of the prime minister. And as I argue in my most recent op-ed, as I said, this is the legacy of the longest running Israeli prime minister to mainstream the most murderous group in Jewish history, in modern Jewish history. So David, then how is it that if they're so um, fringe, how is it that they've, that, that we see a rise in their popularity and how is it that they've become so ingrained in the Likud party? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. How is it that, you know, Israelis, well, first of all, look, it, it's, it's, a, it's a documented fact because Israelis are polled every few years and they're asked, you know, would you be willing to have a non-Jew live in the same building as you? Would you be willing to have a non-Jew study in the same school as your son or daughter? So, you know, people people are asked these questions, the Israelis are pulled, and and they're getting more racist. That's the, the, the scary part, you know? In a, lot of, in a lot of places in the world, the youth are less racist than their parents. Uh, but here we find it's in the opposite. The direction, the trajectory is in the opposite direction. Kids are even more racist than their parents, sadly. So what are the causes for it? The causes are many. And, and I would say that, um, look, the, it's, just, the, it's going to be this way in any society. It's just that the Kahanists have, um, by hook or by crook, they, you know, they've, think about it this way. Here's a way that we can measure their, influ in their, 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 their rise in influence. In the 1980s, when, they, uh, when a member of the Kahanists uh, in Hebron on the Jewish holiday of Purim, shot at a Palestinian car, the response of the Israeli defense minister was to actually raise, to destroy the settlement that that Kahana settler came from. Uh, that was in the 80s, okay? By the 90s, just a decade later, when another Kahanist uh, immigrant from the U.S. 
also pulled out a rifle and shot Palestinians, and this time uh, was successful in his attempt to murder. He murdered 29 Palestinians and wounded over 100 more in 1994. In, in that instance, the response wasn't to uh, shut down the settlement that he came from, but rather to shut down the Palestinian marketplace of Hebron, uh, to shut down the Palestinian community affected by that murder. By the murder perpetrated by Baruch Goldstein. Exactly. And, uh, and now we're already in a position, you know, in, uh, in, here we are in the 2020s and the Israeli defense minister, um, uh, Naftali Bennett, a few months ago, he actually ordered the restoration of the park named after Rabbi Kahana in Hebron, just outside Hebron. So, so now we have, and, 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 the rest of, and that very neighborhood that used to be the Palestinian, thriving Palestinian fruit market uh, will be, he announced, turned into a Jewish settlement, settlement for more you know, extremist Jewish settlers to uh, harass the local Palestinians, the largest Palestinian urban population uh, in the Southern West Bank. You know, David, so in the past, um, we saw that the elections commissions had, they both banned uh, Meir Kahana's party, Kach. Mm -hmm. And then we saw in the last election that at least some of the individuals who are offshoots of, uh, or who are disciples, let's say, of, of Meir Kahana, um, that they were also banned. Why were the, why was the party banned? And uh, like, what did we see, was that the end of it? Did we see the end of Kahanism once the party was banned? Mm -hmm. Okay, good question. So so that, that's what was, you know, earlier I spoke about what was occurring on the ground. In the sense of what was occurring in the Knesset, you know, in the legal sense, in the political sense, um, you know, after Kahana got into the Knesset, the reaction uh, was by many politicians revulsion because his proposals were so explicitly racist, you know, he advocated ethnically cleansing the country of non-Jews, and you know, who didn't uh, agree to swear fealty to, you know, in submission to the Jewish people. So, by definition, you know, like he, at least from some liberal Zionists, and I would say, you know, not too many, even on the ruling Likud party, you know, today Benjamin Netanyahu's, you know, right-wing party, even many of their liberal, you know, uh, uh, many of the Likud lawmakers. Um, were disgusted. In fact, one of them, Dan Merido, led the efforts in the Knesset to have Kahana banned for racist incitement. You know, they changed the laws so that if someone makes explicitly racist statements, then they are prohibited from being candidates for Knesset. So, you know, that's the reason why he was banned in 1988. Um, some would say it was also to the advantage of the ruling the Kud party by that point, you know, because... In fact, polls showed that if he was allowed to be, uh, if he would have been allowed rather to run in the following elections in 1988, that in fact he would have maybe received 10 seats or more in the Knesset, maybe 10% of the Knesset. In that case, he would have certainly been a minister um, by, the, by the standards of those days. Today, you only need to have like a couple seats, a few seats to be a minister. But then, you, you know, he would have had to have more and he would have, he would have been one. But uh, the, so he could have a good reason to ban him. That's 88. What happened between then and now? Well, we just earlier heard about uh, some of the attempts, you know, there were attempts to re-enter the Knesset using a different name, you know, and, and sure, you can't make explicitly racist statements. And, but of course, that requires some liberal, you know, <laughs> journalist, activist, legislator to researcher to go out and follow and, you know, catalog all the racist statements and then bring them and you know, in any case, it didn't it didn't come to that because they didn't have enough, you know, they didn't represent enough of a threat. They didn't have enough votes to pass the uh, threshold that Israeli Knesset kept raising to prevent small parties like Kahana's from entering the Knesset. So all those years, they didn't have, if it was 30,000 votes or 50,000 votes or what, whatever. But but now you need over 100,000 votes uh, to get into the Knesset. And the Kahanists are... That's a lot of votes to get. Do they have 100,000? No. When they ran on their own a few years ago in their newly constituted Jewish power party, um, they did manage to get tens of thousands of votes, but not enough. So they had to combine with another Kahanist light party. I mean, is the leader of the religious Zionism party they bonded with 
Bezalel Smotrich any less of a Kahanist. He, you know, his famous plan is literally taken straight from Kahanism's playbook. It's three options. You know, non-Jews, the Palestinians have three options according to him: either leave the country or agree to be slaves to the Jews. You know, like swear fealty to them, as I said, or die by the sword. Those are the you know the same principle, three principles of Kahana. So what's the difference between? Oh, it's okay, he, you know, maybe you know, put a bow tie on him, put some lipstick on him. It's just Kahanism light. And in any case, this this new party with the Kahanists and the Kahanist lights, whatever you want to call them, they now, thanks to the blessing of Benjamin Netanyahu, who's been, you know, using his political capital to urge for this union in order to give the right wing party enough seats in the Knesset so that he can remain in power and not be in, uh, taken to jail for corruption crimes that he's uh, been charged with. So, so because of the confluence of both rising racism that's been constant in Israeli society every year, plus the c- continuous determination of the Kahanists to get in there, and the addition of Benjamin Netanyahu, longest serving prime minister in Israeli history, you know, being up to his neck in corruption crimes and, you know, pulling in every direction, willing to do anything, even to bring in the Judeo fascists, even to bring in the most murderous, you know, Jewish faction in modern Jewish history, even then. So it's those three contributing factors that allowed the Kahanists this time to get into the Knesset. I know that's a mouthful, but... Um... But, you know, it's not just uh, Smotrich, it's also Lieberman. Lieberman mm-hmm. has also espoused the same viewpoints mm-hmm. of of loyalty or leave. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, true, it's... That's, true. that's a good point. There's so many, yeah. And K- K- Lieberman uh, was a member of the Kach party back in the day, you know, but back in the day, you know, when Netanyahu brought him into the cabinet at that point, you still had to be an ex kahanist to get into government, you know, same with Sachi Negbi, he'd also been with, you know, with, yes. been with Kahana, and then he also, you know, had to be an ex kahanist in order to get into, but into Netanyahu's government in 1996. But uh, yeah, you're right, there's so many, so many, we really have to count those. So, you know, David, um, should we be afraid? Should Palestinians be afraid, or should should those who are not Kahana supporters be afraid, or is this just a continuation of the same old policies? Mm-hmm. Well, look, uh, I would argue that in when the Kahanists got into the Knesset in the last decade, and I, I mean in two thousand nine, two thousand nine to two thousand thirteen, they had a Kahanist in the Knesset. Again, not under the official title of the Kahanist party. He got in a, a far-right slate, uh, will remain nameless. But the point is that uh, it wasn't, a, you know, officially Kahana brand. But he was one of Kahana's students. And and Michael Ben-Ari, Dr. Michael Ben-Ari, he really was instrumental in many ways in, uh, you know, putting pressure on the Israeli government so that it would take a very hard line against a new group of non-Jews that have been living in the country in recent in the last decade and a half, and that's the African refugees from East Africa, asylum seekers, and so from Eritrea and um, and Sudan mainly, but but also other countries in the region. And you know, we were we've long heard of you know the, the Israel's conflict with Palestinians, but. Not many people are familiar with, I'm not going to get too much into the African refugee issue, but the point is that with the arrival of this non-Jewish group, you know, Kahanists as outright Jewish supremacists who want to ethnically cleanse the country of all non-Jews, they oppose them as well. Um, And so as the vanguard of the far right leading rallies in South Tel Aviv, ramping up racism that turned into race riots, it turned into firebombing African kindergartens and African people's homes in, in South Tel Aviv. And these race rallies started attracting members of the Knesset from the ruling Likud party, from Netanyahu's party, you know. And then what Netanyahu would do was then make those lawmakers the ones responsible for the anti-African policies and then instituted. So we, and, and you know, the, the, those that were most active on the ground in South Tel Aviv, the, the up-and-coming racist activists, they were then tapped, you know, first they worked with the Kahanist movement on the ground, and then Netanyahu recruited them into the ruling Likud party, Shefi Paz, Mai Golan, they're his, you know, people there. And and uh, anyone following the African refugee story knows that it's that Kahanist Shefi Paz that that worked within the Netanyahu government. We, he would bring her into the cabinet meetings and her and Mai Golan, they, they successfully managed to stave off a UN plan that would have resettled 
these refugees, these African refugees, giving them status. But, you know, they, they, they didn't want any. They weren't willing to, have, to, you know, to compromise unless it was total ethnic cleansing that they got. They didn't want just, you know, 30,000 African. They wanted all 60,000 ethnically cleansed gone. Yada. So, so because of, the, you know, these Kahanas racists that Netanyahu tapped, that incident, you know, that, that's that's the policy now. We've we've uh, we've lost thirty thousand African refugees. Some thankfully resettled in other countries. Uh, you know, after applying, because these refugees are getting uh, accepted in other countries. It's only Israel that has the worst, not only, but it certainly is the worst in the world with the lowest refugee acceptance rate. You know, point blank, statistically, according to UN stats. So, so you know, the, the point is, Ben Ari did that. He wasn't the only one. Certainly, it was a confluence, but it was the. Kahanist Ben Ari leading the charge in South Tel Aviv and, you know, infl- uh, uh, basically, as I say, like demarking the, the contours of a new race war. In addition to the race war against Palestinians and against the race war against mixed families, Jewish Palestinian families, also now race war against this new group. And, and he can claim a great deal of responsibility for that race war and the, the loss of 30,000 people from the country and the, the, the shadow over many, many more. So, yeah, that's a success. These guys, the second that they get into power, they have an even bigger platform from which to demand, you know, the Likud moves even further to the right and the whole system moves. Ben, you know, ben Gvir, the current Jewish power leader, said it himself. He's like, it does, he said this a couple of years ago, but it's, it's, the same, it's the same thing. He's like, it doesn't matter whether we get in because then it was, it was borderline whether they get in. It doesn't matter whether we get in or we don't get in. Because... Regardless, we are moving the whole Knesset to the right. We are moving the whole government to the right. We're moving the prime minister to the right. So we're moving everything to the right by being at the vanguard and, and, and fighting hard as they have without any countervailing left wing push. So they, uh, yeah. And so what, what do you expect that they will, what, what do you expect that they'll do now that they're going to be in the Knesset? Are they going to be pushing for certain types of legislation? And what should we be looking out for? What should we be concerned about? Mm-hmm. Specifically, what to be, uh, you know, where, to be, where should our attentions be focused in order to anticipate their next moves? Well, okay. The leader of the Jewish Power Party, uh, Itamar Ben Gvir, is a licensed lawyer in Israel. And he apprenticed at the office of Baruch Ben Yosef one of the suspected assassins of Alex Arda. And uh, he, since he got his legal license in 2012, he has, and even beforehand, he was, you know, at the, at the, basically always fighting the Kahanist fight. You know, he basically took over uh, Baruch Ben Yosef's caseload, always defending the most racist murderer, you know, Israelis who, you know, killed Palestinians. And so, you know, he took over the new caseload of the new Israeli terror, new Kahanist terrorists, new wave. Um, but in addition to that, you know, always, you know, with legal challenges, you know, um, for example, you know, he, someone, this is kind of an infamous case of, of uh, Israeli law when, uh, one an Israeli liberal Zionist journalist called Itamar Ben Gvir and called you know called him like a little Nazi, you know he called Kahanists Nazis and Itamar Ben Gvir that little Nazi. So uh, this actually you know he he sued him for libel. How dare you call me a Nazi? That's a grave 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 uh, thing to say. Well, it came to an Israeli court. In fact, it came to the Supreme Court. And what was decided in that case was okay. Yes. In fact, it is libelous to call Itamar Ben Gvir and Kahanists Nazis. However, that same court, you know, punished said liberal Zionist journalist by fining him for that crime one shackle, which is equivalent to like an American quarter. So thereby essentially authorizing that, you know what? If it's not Zionism, if it's not Nazism, if Kahanism isn't Nazism, it's like a shade lighter. And not more. And 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 so the point is, Itamar Ben Gvir has always been at the forefront of the legal struggle, you know, uh, in the courts. And and as such, he has a tremendous amount of experience. He knows very well judges all across the country. He's been in court so many times. He knows their their judicial records, how they you know uh, how they decide. And so as such, he has been tapped in recent years, even before he even got into the Knesset. You know, he was working with uh, fellow uh, 
genocide in, insider Ayala, minister Ayala Chaked to working with Ayala Chaked when she was justice minister to kind of prepare lists of good judges and bad judges. So who she should be giving promotions to and who she shouldn't give me promotions to because they're suspected of you know, ruling that believing that Palestinians are human beings and therefore, you know, deserve rights. And so oh, oh, they're suspect. Don't give them promotions or advancement. So, so, yeah, even beforehand, he's had a really big influence in the legal sphere. It seems obvious that, you know, his his uh, that that's one give me one of the ways that he influences. They've long been calling for, you know, this rule that will uh, neuter the Supreme Court so that it cannot be the final breaks on the excesses of the government and the legislature to prevent the worst, you know, abuses of the rights of Palestinians and other non-Jews and other minorities. So, but uh, yeah, it seems that that's going to be the direction that they're going to be focused on. But uh, but but who can say? Who can say? It's all kind of up in the air now. But certainly these are the most racist and most murderous. Uh, the, the furthest right, you, we need to be watching them like hawks because uh, nothing good can come of them being in the Knesset. Well, David Sheen, thank you very much. This has been illuminating, and I really appreciate your time. Mm, mm, mm. Thank you so much for having me. David, where can we see your writings and your work? Really easy to get at me. Just one way, go to my website, davidsheen.com, and from there there's links to everything, YouTube, Twitter, um, you know, lists of my most recent articles, and i got lots of videos out there that you don't want to miss. Um, but, but davidsheen.com, and on Twitter it's at David Sheen. Thank you very much, David. Thank you for listening to This is Palestine, a podcast brought to you by the Institute for Middle East Understanding. The IMEU is a nonprofit focused on giving you access to untold stories, facts, and expert sources on all things Palestine. For more information, please visit our website at www.imeu.org and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at the IMEU. Please don't forget to subscribe. I'm Deanna Butu. Thanks for listening.